Hello and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Dr. Donald Pelto and today I have uh, Dr. Chris Bromley here and we're going to be talking a little bit about podiatry and specifically, Chris, let's talk a little bit about what you're passionate about. Thanks, Don. It's always a pleasure to be here. I'm very passionate over the last 15 years about sort of the holistic approach to health. You know, so much of what we've done in healthcare and what I was trained to do, and I'm sure you as well, when I was in my training was about giving a prescription for a medication um, to relieve symptoms. But we really weren't trained to focus on health. That is the pursuit of health. And so many things happen when we're not healthy. For example, so many of my patients were home the last four to five months as part of the COVID crisis. They were barefoot. They were eating horribly, they weren't exercising, and they were stressed out. Mm -hmm. So what happened was we end up seeing these patients now, and they're you know, they have increased, you know, foot pain, heel pain, leg pain, back pain, stress. You know, they're just all really stressed out. So I think what I'm what I'm very passionate about right now is is really focusing on health. That is, you know, talking to our patients about you know why they came in. You're here with heel pain today. But the reason you have heel pain is because you spent the last few months at home, barefoot. You're not stretching. You're not exercising. You're not eating right. Mm -hmm. You're not taking the right supplements. So the guiding light of my practice has always been the holistic approach to health. I'm not about cortisone injections. I'm not about giving you a drug to cover your symptoms. I'm about talking to you about what happened to you biomechanically, meaning what is the underlying foot deformity? And then what are we doing for you to get you better? And, and you're a big part of that. Now, in terms of patients, if you have this conversation with them, some take your advice and are, are really friendly towards that and others aren't. Uh, what do you do with those that aren't on the bandwagon? They just want a quick cortisone and, and get out of the office. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, because I've been doing this so long, I tend to attract into my practice the type of patients that I would like to see because I've treated, let's say a triathlete and they thought, wow, oh, it was great. Dr. Bromley got me better without a shot, without a drug. And they refer five of their friends or their other athletes. So mm -hmm. very rarely do I actually see somebody who'll come in and will say, well, I only really want a shot because this is what happened. I got 10 years ago and it got me better. And it's my opportunity to convince them about the fact that medicine has evolved, just like the rest of our lives have evolved. You and I both use ultrasound quite a bit, mm -hmm. and I'll show them where the pathology is and why a cortisone injection or a pill to cover their symptoms is not gonna make them better. If I have somebody that's really resistant and doesn't really wanna talk about proper shoe gear, proper weight, the things they need to be doing, I look at them in the eye and say to them, um, you know, I wish them the best of luck. This is what I would do. And I'm happy to give you the name of three or four other physicians who might like to treat you that way. But it's, it's not, it doesn't work for me and it doesn't help my, my goal in the pursuit of excellence mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. excellence for their health by, you know, sort of bringing myself back down to that level that I gave up 15 years ago. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. So this, this excitement and, and passion has evolved over the years. You weren't always like this. You were doing the traditional cortisone injections and strapping really, and things like that. I, I grew up in the in the sporting good business. I, I had the pleasure of growing up. My family owned a chain of ski and sporting good business. And we were into tennis and biking and skiing. And I grew up with these like super healthy, you know, customers and family members. And I was all really about health. Mm -hmm. uh, podiatry came to me because I met a podiatrist when I was playing, you know, travel soccer and needed somebody and really was inspired by him. So I, I was never really about and never really understood in the beginning of my profession, why we were just giving patients a pill or a shot to cover up the symptoms. We weren't really talking about the underlying pathology. And it was one of my best friends in the whole world, Dr. Carol Ann Melizia, who's a world-renowned chiropractor, and uh, he, she specialized in whole food nutrition. She lectured all over the world. We grew up together. And shortly after I graduated from medical school, she, she sort of converted me over from the dark side. She said, let me explain to you why you need to think about nutrition and diet and exercise. And she taught me about low-level laser um, 20 years ago. She taught me about K-tape. You know, she just taught me, and she sort of opened my eyes to 
uh, what, what was possible outside of that sort of old school medicine approach to health. You know, it sounds like these things really excite you. You know, you, you, you probably enjoy going to work and things like that. Do, do things like frustrate you in terms of that? Or for most patients, are you able to help them with this, with this exciting way of treating them? I, you know, I think because I've been here for a long time, I mean, I'm almost 20 years in practice, 28 years, excuse me. And I think that I draw people into my practice. I really believe there's a great um, book. Um, written by Wayne Dyer, D-Y-E-R. Wayne, if you know Wayne, it was all about you get what you visualize. Mm. So I, I visualize every morning, um, you know, what type of a practice I want to have, what kind of things I want to do today. I get up in the morning, I look at all the patients' names in my schedule before they come in. I sort of get in my mind's eye what I, how I want that day to go. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm good at my visualization, that's kind of what happens. If I, if I get off track or I have a day where there's some frustrations, um, I take a look at what I'm thinking and I, you know, I really resort to my core values. And uh, one of the things I love about what we're doing today is about teaching. You know, we're inspiring patients and other, and other professionals to, to, you know, to take their health and to take their care, particularly in the foot and ankle space, to a higher level. So that's what, it, that's what keeps me on the track. That's awesome. That's awesome. And where do you see the, the future of podiatry? What excites you for the future? Things like you were 20 years ago doing cold lasers, you're doing ultrasound now, or probably 10 years ago, shockwave now. Where, where do you see the future going? That's a great question. I, what, I, what I see the future of podiatry is really sort of taking what we know. What we know in podiatry that's different than our orthopedic colleagues is we know all of the biomechanics. We know all the conservative, non-surgical, non-cortisone injection way to get people. So in my practice, I think a lot about regenerative medicine. What mm -hmm. can I do to regenerate a plantar fascia or a tendon or a joint? So those things in my office could be the low-level laser. It could be incorporation with an orthotic. Maybe we're going to use a uh, allograft injection. So we have those placental allografts that moms donate as part of their birth plan. We used to only have them in the hospital. We have them here in our clinic. So if you come in and you have a damaged area, you and I are no longer young kids, right? We don't have the growth hormone and the, and the growth factors that we had as young people. We can take those allografts and, and, and make those part of our treatment protocol. So what I'm most excited about for the future of podiatry is the regenerative side of podiatry. What can we do in the wound care space? For example, when I started practice, you know, you would figure out what kind of antibiotic ointment you would put on a wound and you would maybe trim it a little bit periodically and it would take six or eight months for that to heal. What we have now in our practice is we have lots of skin substitutes, those things that may be collagen, they may be fish skin, they may be biologic grafts, they may be porcine grafts, there may be lots of different products that we can use to regenerate, not only get the wound healed, but heal it in a much better way so that it stays healed. And then we're also doing advanced testing on the vascular side to make sure we get to the underlying disease. We're treating the patients holistically for the neuropathy, and then we're talking to them about diet, and we're talking to them about lifestyle. So I think if we put all of that regenerative together, we're not just putting a Band-Aid on a problem. We're mm -hmm. actually treating it and getting it to heal long-term and to stay healed. Now, now, for a lot of people, they might be thinking, you know, you know that, that sounds great. You know, I have to see my 30 or 60 patients a day. How do you have time to, to go into this with, with, with your patients? Is it something that you just spend more time and you run behind? Do you have certain brochures or, or you know, things that you share with them? What's the best way you found to incorporate this into your practice? The, you know, that's a great point. I think that the, I typically see somewhere between 20 to 30 patients a day. And mm -hmm. I will typically see uh, six to 12 new patients a day. That's my average day. Um, and I schedule 30 minutes for a new patient, mm -hmm. 30 minutes of my time. What typically happens is the patient will be coming in 15 minutes before that time. They will have seen, they have all their information pre-populated. So all the forms they would normally fill out are done before. So the MAs are spending time in the room with the patient before I get there. So if the 30 minute visit with me is preempted by a virtual check-in before they get here. And then they're here, they get all their vitals and things done. So I have 30 minutes to interview the patient and find out what's important to them. If they have 
three or four things because people will wait. They'll say, oh, okay, well, I have heel pain, ingrown toenail, and my fungal toenails. Okay. So I will say to them, what would you, what is most important to you? What do you want to focus on today? Because I really want to give you the most I can for what's most important to you. So let's say it might be heel pain. So today we'll do the ultrasound, talk about the heel pain, talk about the regenerative use, the handouts, the things that we do. You've done, you've done a great job in your practice with some of the, you know, the video tools mm -hmm. and the pictures that you show patients. So I think that is just figuring out what you can do in that 30 minutes and say, listen, I, to the patient, I, I have more than I want to share with you. I know that you have more concerns that we need to go. We're going to get together next week and we're going to go into the part two of our treatment. What are we doing next? So you don't have to get it all done in 30 minutes or 15 minutes. Just schedule the time. And if you have somebody that you saw a 15 minute and it's, it looks like it's going to go long, I say, listen, what I would love to do is give you the time you need. Let's go ahead and schedule a half hour next visit so we can really get into what you need to get into. It's all about time management. You know, that's great. And, and let's go down to the billing section because we're talking practice management. Um, new patient, usually level three or level four, new patient, mm -hmm. you're doing ultrasound, you're doing maybe whatever type of treatment. When you see them in a week for another, let's say fungal toenails in a week, are you doing like a level two follow-up? Is that what you're doing? Something like that? Yes. And I think that, you know, the key to the so the initial visit is making sure that you have documented, you know, the time, not only the time that you spent with the patient, but I'll spend time in the morning reviewing the record before my, my day even starts. I'll look at your chart if you're my patient before I go in the room. So I've reviewed your past medical history, social, you know, medications, prior visits. So I've spent time, you know, I document that time. And I put that into my note, you know, that I reviewed this, I reviewed that. Um, uh, so we get the, the level three or level mm -hmm. four that you were looking to get for the first visit. For the follow-up visit, yes, it'll be probably a level two. There may be some additional, you know, some additional testing. Maybe there'll be a strapping or a taping mm -hmm. procedure or something else that's done to make that part of that follow-up. I think, I think that's great. I think a lot of doctors, what they try to do, you could probably attest to this, Chris, is they say, well, I have to do all four things and you get really far behind and you don't really cover any of them, any of the really deep. You don't go deep. You're just like everyone else, right? Yeah. Superficial. Yeah. Just ask the patient, what is the most important thing to you today? And it may not be heel pain. Maybe it's their fungal toenails because they've got a wedding coming up or something. You know, just ask them, what is, what is the most important thing to you? And, and I want, and I know that you've had these for a long time and I want to work through them with you. We're going to do them, you know, uh, as much as the time allows today. And then if we need more time, we'll schedule more time. And yeah. usually if you do that very nicely, people don't really have any problem you know, coming back. We also offer virtual health where we can have the telehealth visits, you know, if they're geographically, I mean, I see patients from Canada, New York City, Pennsylvania, you know, sometimes patients are coming quite a distance. Mm -hmm. um, and once we've done that basic physical exam, and we've done whatever studies, you know, we offer them follow up on the telehealth side. That's awesome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about something simple about going over people that, that do, let's say a, a test, a pathology, do a biopsy or do a nail sample or something like that. Go over and over the results. Do you do those over the phone? Or do you make a separate appointment for that? Uh, I tend to, it depends on what the result is. Obviously, if it's something mundane like a fungal culture, uh, what I would typically do is I'll review the results. Those are signed off and um, initialed by me before they can get into the chart, which is really important. Um, and then if it's an adjunct to a visit and I know they're already scheduled to mm -hmm. come back, Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have my staff call the patient and say, listen, Dr. Brownlee reviewed your results today. These were that, and he's going to go over those Next with time. you when you come in for that visit. If it's a, if it's a more involved pathology, let's say it was a biopsy or a needle aspirate or something that we're doing, typically we will go over those results, you know, with a, with a visit or a telehealth visit. Yeah. Cause one thing that that's been we're kind of talking about exams, like uh, circulatory exams, PadNet or, or ABIs, mm -hmm. we do them. And a lot of times we get the results back, but there's no follow up or maybe a yearly diabetic exam where they're coming in and to review those, you know, I'm always looking for better ways to provide more value to patients. So patients really, you know, I see the value of why I do this every year uh, versus just, you know, forgetting about it or, or not really reviewing it. any good tips for going over circulatory exams to really show value. I I think that's really common. I mean, I, I went through that too. So typically what we would do is um, the pad nets would be done 
and the patient would be coming back to go mm -hmm. over the results. And sort of 25% of the visit is the result. The other 75% is what are we doing about it? Exactly. You know, are you are your ABIs significant enough or your waveforms deformed enough that I'm going to now refer you uh, for advanced vascular testing? Um, we have a couple of different interventionalists and vascular groups we work with. Um, in addition to that, here are your instructions. You are to do this, to walk, to mm -hmm. exercise, you know, the different things that we'd like to do. Um, and then I also make sure that I send a copy of that note to wherever we're going. And then I, and then I schedule them back. Say, listen, I need you to schedule the visit with the consultant. Once you've scheduled that visit, I want you to schedule a visit with me seven days after because I want to go over with you what happened at the visit. And I, and, and please tell the consultant when you're seeing them that I am going back to Dr. Brownlee in seven days. I, he needs to have a report Perfect. back from you so that there's a, and I put that in the note in the plan um, because I had many, many years ago, a diabetic with a, a sore on her toe that recurred. I had referred her to a vascular surgeon when it came back the second time she had, um, she did not follow up with him. She moved out of the area and eventually had a baloney amputation because of a failed bypass. And it was, knock on wood, the, the one and only time I've ever had to worry about a, a malpractice case. And it was the quality of the documentation. And it was the fact that I had made the referral to the vascular doctor, that I had made the phone call, that I had documented, that I had done everything that I needed to do that actually, you know, we prevailed yeah. in that particular wow. situation. Yeah. Wow. So let's, let's go back to the, the regenerative. Sorry, we got off a little tangent there, but we could keep going here. Um, in terms of your practice, you're doing some things that are kind of new in terms of regenerative medicine and other things that no one else is doing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about those things. So the, one of the, the easiest thing that we do on the regenerative side is we use a lot of the cold laser. So we, we talked in a previous interview about using the lunula uh, for fungal toenails and the FX35, which is Raconia's sort of workhorse mm -hmm. for heel pain and chronic pain. So when we talk about low level laser, we're talking about photobiostimulation. So we're stimulating uh, the mitochondria to reduce ATP. We're stimulating uh, neovascularization. We're stimulating granulation. We're stimulating healing. So one of the workhorses on the regenerative side day to day in my practice are the low level lasers that we use. Mm -hmm. Those are, go ahead. Those are, those are, you know, they have their own schedule. I mean, I have, there are four doctors in the office today. The fifth doctor is that laser, you know, so we, the lasers are doing their thing. Um, on the biologic regenerative side, we offer the allograft injections uh, for our athletes and for patients who may be not athletes, but have, you know, soft tissue injuries, plantar fascia ruptures, Achilles, lateral ankle, posterior tibial, um, anything that's sort of degenerative on the musculoskeletal side. And then the other side of the regenerative is we do quite a bit of the allograft treatment for uh, venous stasis, diabetic, mm -hmm. uh, and pressure ulcer. So we don't refer any wounds out. Um, all of the wounds are handled in-house. We do um, home-based chambered um, hyperbaric oxygen uh, where a patient has a leg sleeve instead of having to go to a wound care center five days a week for three hours. They, they treat themselves at home. Um, and, uh, those are the, that's sort of the basics wow. of regenerative. That's, that's exciting for, for those that are, are maybe watching and, and either the residents are starting out and they want to get into regenerative medicine to, to, to see the benefits of it. There are a lot of different amnio type of solutions out there. Any, any ideas? Have you tried different ones? How did you choose the current one? And then how do you explain it to patients in a way that they'll kind of take your recommendation? And are you finding better results than with what you were using previously? Great. So there are basically three regenerative allografts, human allografts that I, that I like. And I, and I have no problem with the collagens or the other skin substitutes that come from other materials, let's say porcine and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, but my favorite is using the uh, allografts that come from the amnion and chorion or umbilical. So in the operating room, when I'm operating, I tend to prefer a thicker graft. So I, for instance, I was doing bunion surgery today. I was doing simple osteotomy, a couple of screws, but I knew based on the x-ray, the patient had probably had significant osteochondral lesion. That would be a defect in the cartilage. So what we did was we, before the bunion surgery, we debrided and drilled out that 
um, hypo that lesion. And mm -hmm. then we, after we were done with the bunion surgery, we took a two by three uh, Vivex from the University of Miami Tissue Bank, makes a two by three umbilical graft. So it has amnion chorion in it. It's a little th thicker. So when you pick it up, it kind of feels like, uh, uh, like almost like a thick piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. and, and you lay that into place and you put a couple of drops of saline and that molds down and is easier to handle. The amnion alone or amnion and chorion tends to be very, very friable, very fragile. As soon as you touch it, 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 it'll either melt. If you put it in the wound and you're not careful, it'll just turn into a little ball of stuff. It doesn't really okay. stay where you put it. So in the operating room, if it's, a, if it's an open case, I'm using an umbilical. If it's a closed, minimally invasive case where we're using a 10X to debride a damaged tendon, Achilles or a plantar fascia or a perineal, or we're then in those cases, we use an injectable amniotic fluid, not a reconstituted membrane, but a, a full on mm -hmm. one CC amniotic or a two CC amniotic graft. In the office, I tend to go thinner. So in the office, I will tend to use the amnion chorions on the wounds. And the mm -hmm. way we explain that to patients is that there are, their wounds are stuck. The wounds, wounds go through an inflammatory, a proliferative and a regenerative phase of healing. Wounds get stuck in the inflammatory phase, which is the beginning phase, and they can't transition forward. Mm -hmm. So the way we transition them forward is we debride out anything that's damaged because we stimulate the healing cascade. And then we're laying down on the wound an allograft, which has all of the cell signaling factors, growth mm -hmm. factors in that product that will stimulate those cells to do what we want them to do. So we, the way I explain it to patients is, you know, if you had a garden and you had soil and water and you're going to grow tomato plants and they said, yes, I said, well, if you put miracle Grow or fertilizer in the soil, do you, you get a lot bigger tomatoes faster, right? And they said, oh yeah, 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 it's great. Well, allografts are, well, I tell patients, they're like using miracle Grow for your body. It's like using something that's special that you don't have in your body anymore. That's awesome. I, I think using analogies really help. Um, any good analogies? That's with wounds. How about with, let's say, plantar fascia, Achilles? How, how do you determine and, and explain to patients, you know, some of the things that we use were orthotics, maybe shockwave or EPAT, and then adding, when do you determine to add in the amnio component of it? How, how does that work in your hands? So, well, let's use plantar fascia, for example. So let's say a patient comes in today, you know, they've had heel pain for the last four months. Uh, maybe it's longer. Um, typical, get a good history, find out what they're doing wrong at home, which is probably barefoot. Look at their shoes, lifestyle, they're overweight, they don't eat right. We would typically do an ultrasound mm -hmm. so that we can see the damage. I will usually do both feet so that I could show them one versus the other. And then I will talk to them about, I, it's the same treatment analogy. You have three options today. Number one, most popular treatment of all, ignoring it, hoping it's gonna go away. And they nod their head. I say, great, we're done with that, right? Super. Option two are the conservative treatments, and these are not conservative politically. Conservative meaning no needles, no scalpels. I said, you're, you're interested in that, right? They nod their head, yes. I said, great. So those things are, I gotta get you into a better shoe, Here's the shoe you're going to get. This is the store you're going to get. Okay. I'm going to scan you for orthotics today because no matter what shoe you buy, it's not made for you. It's made for somebody in the factory. So there's, there's nothing. So we want to make sure you have orthotics. While we're waiting for your orthotics to come back, you're going to do the following things at home. You will stretch. You will use contrast heat and cold. You will not go barefoot ever. Uh, and you will use K-tape that I will apply to you today and you will change it every few days until your orthotics get back. If it's in the middle of the hot summer, like we're having this summer, I might use a plantar fascial sleeve, something that you can pull on and wear. Or I work with Incrediware, which makes a wearable uh, sleeves. These are gadolinium and carbon impregnated uh, wearables, which I'm very excited about. We use those instead. Mm -hmm. When they come back, they'll get their orthotic. They will have been doing everything that I asked them to do at home and they should be getting better, and we do a follow-up ultrasound, and we should see the plantar fascial thickness go down, and the hypoechoic area, which is the damaged area of the fascia, will get smaller. If they're getting better, it's because they're doing everything right. 
there's a small percentage of the patients who won't. Maybe they had a couple of cortisone injections someplace else, somebody who shall remain nameless, uh, where the fascia is not is actually fully ruptured, or you'll see it avulsed off the planter and, and it slid forward, you know, a sonometer or two. So those patients may get better enough to not need anything invasive. If they need something more than the shock wave or an allograft injection, or if it's really bad, they might need a 10X debridement with an allograft. So those are the things. And I, I like what Shockwave does. I had Shockwave in my practice for years. I had the company come every week. I personally think that Shockwave works great. I don't wanna be the one standing there doing the Shockwave every treatment. So I tend to lean more toward the allograft mm -hmm. side of the, of, the, of the equation. So I'll kind of steer the conversation a little bit more toward the allograft. And that is, we do that in the office. For a plantar fascia, we use a half CC. For an Achilles, we may use a full CC. Uh, and those are typically out of pocket, but I, I make it very reasonable. Half a CC is 250. Uh, full CC is 500 and that we have care picks and a number of other ways for them to finance that and we will package that You know if they you know, like when they get orthotics, they usually get two pairs um, And we can package the orthotics with the allograft all together and then make that part of the care picks package. That's awesome. I think the the explanation of this is is key for those that are watching because a lot of times you try to wrap around our head around this and it gets too complex. So I think having, that's where I think protocols are, are really important. Even if it's not a written protocol, it's a protocol in your mind. And the only way to develop that is learn it from someone, shadow someone or, or figure it out yourself. So I think what you just offered here was golden uh, for people. Now, how does care picks involve in that? I, I think you mentioned care picks. Sure. I was, I was, I, I misspoke. I wasn't about care picks. I was talking about um, care credit. Care credit. That's what I thought. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I thought. No, I, I think I think that's great. I think that's great. So I'll, I'll put a lot of these notes underneath this video. And as we finish up here, I just want to talk about kind of what are a couple of things you're you're proud of uh, in in your practice. You know, what are what are going well for you? Well, the the I'm most proud of obviously having an amazing family. I have a beautiful wife who loves me dearly you know, and puts up with all my travel and all the things that I have to do to to with my career. And obviously, I have three beautiful children. My twins are 15 and are surviving this new normal you yeah. know, education and my younger son Alexander's eight he's also doing well as far as a practice I'm most proud of the fact that you know when I left residency I, I went to work for a guy who had been my mentor uh, that didn't work out for a couple of reasons and I basically had a black medical bag and I had a nursing home to go to to cut toenails and I could do house calls that's all I had I didn't have the money to open an office I, I borrowed office space from a primary care doctor. I hung the shingle, you know, I hung my certificate yep. in the room. I had one room and that was it. And within a short period of time, I, you know, I developed a thriving practice. I got in a partner, we added in, you know, a number of associates and in a period of about uh, 10 years or so, I went from a black bag going house to house to having a $4 million huge, you know, That's awesome. successful practice one location, not a bunch of locations. Um, and we were doing cutting edge, you know, cutting edge podiatry and providing the very best level of care. And I, and I grew a practice that was the kind of practice that I wanted to live in. I don't do a lot of sort of regular routine care. I mean, I have mm -hmm. podiatrists here that, that do that, but I grew the practice that I wanted to be in, mm -hmm. which is the regenerative health work with athletes. I like doing surgery, but I, I enjoy doing you know, the wound care and this and the regenerative stuff is much, you know, so I grew the practice that I wanted to be. That's great, Chris. Uh, as we finish up, if people want, it seems like you, you have a lot of knowledge to share. Do you ever share knowledge with people kind of one-on-one -on -one or do any coaching like that? I, I do. I have a, a consulting company called Influx and Influx is an I, a new ideas and new capital for your practice. So I, um, I've talked to you about, you know, wanting to be able to work with you to help mm -hmm practices because I think that we all you we've seen in life that there are life coaches people have life coaches and nowadays if you don't have a therapist there must be something wrong with you because everybody has a therapist I think that we would be um, we'd be doing a great service to our colleagues to provide coaching uh, to their 
you know, their day-to-day -day practices, you know, those people who are on their own or starting out or even practices that are established that would like to sort of revitalize and redesign their practice to be what they want it to be in their dreams. Very good. Well, thank you, Chris, for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you for watching Healthy Living. You're gonna find a few links here I'd like you to click. One is to subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Uh, also, you can learn more. There are some videos here you can see.